Hello, everyone. You can take your seats. Uh, thanks a lot for being here and for such a warm welcome. It's my first time at J Prime, and I already enjoy the conference. I hope so do you. And uh, today I'm going to talk with you about a healthy diet for your Java application with such a catchy title. And today we are going to talk more precisely about your memory consumption and memory leaks, out of memory errors, and so on. But before we start, let me introduce myself. Uh, I've also already introduced. My name is Margarita. I work at Sonar. So you can see my Twitter handle. If you want to follow me, you can. Uh, sometimes I post some technical stuff, sometimes stuff about work. And I'm a big fan of different programming languages like Java, Kotlin, Scala. And for my everyday job, I write static analysis for them. And there is one more important thing that you should know about me, that I'm Ukrainian. And you know, today we have a big problem with our neighbors. And uh, currently, we need all the support that you can give to us. So if you, will, if you, if you feel like you want to support Ukraine, uh, you can use this QR code. Uh, it goes to some charity fund that helps Ukrainians. And uh, feel free to scan it and help us. Thanks a lot for that. So the most important part of my presentation is done. <laughs> now I can breathe freely. So yeah. Uh, short disclaimer. Today, what I'm going to present you, it's not a rocket science. Most likely, mostly all of you every, know everything about like memory, know everything that I'm going to talk to you today. But maybe this presentation will help you to have more structurized knowledge and help you to actually use it in your daily work. And another disclaimer, there is no cellular bully. So every time like, you face some problem with your memory, most likely you have to treat it differently, find some other solutions. But I'll try to give you some hints, some recipes, some maybe guidelines that you can use in your work and uh, make your applications more memory efficient. So how it all started? Why actually I'm here talking about memory to you? Um, yeah, some time ago, you probably know this guy. If you don't know him, it's Alexei Shipilo. He is very famous for his contributions in OpenGDK, also for maintaining projects like GMH, GC Stress, Java Object Layout. And currently, he is principal engineer in languages and runtime at Amazon Web Services. So pretty cool guy, known one. and. In our company at Sonar, he is also famous for analyzing OpenGDK in Sonar Cloud. So basically, in Sonar Cloud, you can find OpenGDK that is analyzing the C++ and Java code. And one day, he came to us and said, I want to analyze my Java and C++ code in Sonar Cloud, which is a valid case, using 3 gigabytes of RAM. We're like, OK, that could be tricky. And he cannot. So basically, when he tried to analyze his uh, project in Sonar Cloud, it fell down with some out of memory. So that was some time to think. And um, like why it's so important for us. If you're using Sonar Cube or Sonar Cloud, most likely you're using it in pair with your continuous integration. So yeah, we provide you analysis. We provide you some nice UI in Sonar Cube, Sonar Cloud. But you pay for your machine. So you pay for analysis itself, because it's machines probably in some Amazon or Azure or Google Cloud or in any other cloud providers. And so if we use more memory, you pay for this memory. And because we care about our customers, we'll try to be more memory efficient. And that's why this got our attention. And if you're using SonarLint, this is our plugin for IDE. You're using it inside your IDE and most likely using your local resources. So that's why we have to be efficient, because like, your laptop might not be that. Uh, like, we don't want your laptop to consume that many much memory and energy. So we care about you. That's why we have to deal somehow. And it was exactly the same time when I get back to work after my maternity leave. And I have to come back in my shape, because I just gave birth. I was not in shape that I wanted to. And while analyzing these memory leaks and trying to get back in shape, in my brain, everything mixed. 
So I find out a lot of similarities in the way how you can make your applications memory efficient and how you actually can become fit by yourself. So there was one question appeared in my head, am I making my application fit too? And that's how the idea of the stock appeared. So I come up with some algorithm, what you can do to make your application fit. First of all, the first thing that you should do before you start doing anything is like, is there any problem? Like, ask yourself, do you have a problem here? Why? Because I'm a Java developer. I don't want to think about memory. I want GC to do all the job. Because like using Java was the reason while back in the universities, I stopped using C++ and started using Java because I didn't want to care about memory. Didn't want to write some destructors, whatever, because I thought like GC could do all the job. But garbage collector is not a wizard. It's great, but he cannot collect objects if they're referenced. And it's your job to make sure that something that you don't need is not referenced. So first of all, you have to answer the questions, do you have a problem? So what are the symptoms of potential problem with your memory consumption? If we are talking about body, because we have some analogy with fitness and getting back in shape, uh, usually, like, what are the signs that I have a problem? My clothes are too small. I have higher fat percentage. It's difficult for me to run, work, or do any exercise. Uh, my BMI might be too high. I'm always hungry, and I'm actually not satisfied with my appearance. So the only reason why you should do something if you are not satisfied, like if you look at the mirror and say, yeah, I am beautiful, I don't have any problem, maybe you should not like, do anything because you are already satisfied. But if you are not, then you have to do something. The same with an application. Like, what are the symptoms of uh, some problems with memory? First of all, out of memory error. The same as if your clothes are too small. You can just buy uh, bigger clothes. The same, you can just give more memory. But if it's something that you don't want to pay for, if you want to reduce it, OK, maybe you have to look there. Another problem, poor performance. Uh, sometimes, if you have some memory leaks, uh, garbage collector cannot do their job, but they try to. And that's why it affects performance. Uh, you give more memory, and it doesn't help. So sometimes, uh, this also signals about the problem. You spend much time on garbage collection, spend too much CPU, and so on. So there are some symptoms. And it's extremely important to understand that just one symptom could not say that you have a memory leak. For example, yeah. So you have to measure. So next step is about uh, when you asked uh, the question, is there any problem? And then you answered, yes, there is a problem. Let's start measuring. Because how you can reduce something if you don't know how much it is? So how can we measure? If we talk about body, it's weight, fat muscles percentage, BMI, heart rate, blood tests, whatever. So whatever can help you to identify any problem works for you. And and one of the most important is eating habits. Because firstly, to understand what diet you should follow, you should understand what you are eating currently. And then maybe you can minimize something. The same goes with your application. Firstly, you have to try to measure your performance. I know measuring performance is hard. It's probably another topic for a different uh, like maybe talk, or maybe you can have a full conference talking about performance. So my point is just try to measure it somehow. Another CPU usage. Uh, another problem, like if you have an out of memory, you should generate a heap dump to understand what was actually what caused the problem. And uh, it's actually a good practice to do heap dumps from time to time to monitor what's going on there. So heap dump is another stuff that you can measure, uh, logs, and whatever. So whatever you can find out, that will help us help you to investigate the problem. And it's very important to understand that just weight or just like uh, usage of memory is not enough to say whether you have a memory leak or no. Because look at this graph. Is there any leak or no? How do you think? And the answer is like, I have no idea. I have no idea. Maybe it's just a normal natural consumption. 
Maybe it's just what your application should consume. And then if we have like a second graph, which is CPU usage or GC activity, you can see that, OK, on the graph, I can see that GC tried to do some job, and he failed. So maybe there is some problem. Maybe there is a leak, so it forced investigation. But if GC do their job and everything works fine, most likely there is no leak. So, and Alexei Shipilov, he understands all these pain points, how hard it is to debug memory leaks. Uh, he provided us heap dumps, logs, all the like, even memory analysis to help us investigate everything. So he was a good guy. Every time you report to us any memory leak, please do like Alexei. Uh, and the first thing that we found out was like log. We found out that there was out of memory. And then our attention was caught by this stuff. So it's com.sonar.cpp something. And it's this package signals that this out of memory comes from C++ analyzer. That's great. I'm from Java analyzer. We are not those people. It's not us. <laughs> Let's give it to C++ team. And now, uh, be attentive. I have to reveal you one secret. It's a secret that will change your life. So if you don't want to hear it, just close your ears, because your life will never going to be the same. If you have out of memory error, and you have a stack trace. The best thing that you can do with a stack trace is to take it and throw it away. Because when we are analyzing out of memory, stack trace is almost useless. Because out of memory happens when you ran out of memory. It doesn't mean that there is a, mem a problem with memory there. Problem could be much earlier. So that's exactly what happened. Like there was some problem earlier. Uh, like, for example, Java Analyzer ate all of the memory. And then there was like tiny slice of memory left for C++ Analyzer, and C++ Analyzer could not like, do their work. And that's why we got out of memory. So it would be unfair to go to C++ team and say, fix it, because problem was not there. So, and of course, we didn't do that, because we understand that the problem was not there. Uh, so once we measured everything, we gathered all possible metrics, all the data that we have. That was time to analyze. And in order to analyze the heap dump, I think the best thing to do is to do some demo. Uh, so I am going to use Visual VM and show you some small example. So I hope it's visible to you. Uh, so when you have heap dump, you look at this in Visual VM. I hope you already seen this UI. You have something like this. Uh, it's pretty hard to understand what's going on here. There are a lot of numbers, a lot of classes, but uh, sometimes there should be something that catches your attention. In our case, for example, you see that byte array uh, holds like 96.1% uh, uh, of memory. So maybe we can look and have a look what's going on there. So let's go here. Here we see all the instances of byte arrays. And what we can do, uh, we can try to calculate GC roots. I've already pre-calculated it. And let's find out why this is still in memory. So you see that this byte array is value in some content, which is a full name class. Then it holds in some array list. And then, OK, you see static names cache, which is already tricky. So uh, this value is still alive because somehow something static references it. If you go look at other instances, you can find that all of them are referenced in the same static field. OK, let's get back to our presentation. And I have a question for you. So I'll ask you one question that is here, and I'll ask you to raise your hands if you can, like, would like to vote for this or that. So please raise your hand if, th if you think that static fields are eligible for garbage collection when the last instance is collected. No one? OK, that's the second option. When class instance is collected. Hey, raise your hands. I raised my hand that class instance is collected, so our field should be eligible for garbage collection. 
The third option, when GVM exits. Okay, makes sense. Uh, when class is unloaded. Cool. And none of the above. Come on. <laughs> okay, what can I tell you? Those of you who answered B, C, or D are halfly right. Because in order to answer this question, we need to understand a little bit how static works. Uh, usually when we are like working in Java, we are working with instances. So like your object instance. And your instance usually holds like a reference to the class of which we are the instance. And then class holds a reference to static field. So uh, because it's static, it's not a field of your instance, it's a field of a class. So class knows about static field. And class also know about class loader that's, that loaded the class. And then class loader knows about all the classes that it loaded. So basically, if you want to make your static field eligible for garbage collection, you have to make sure that there is, it's not referenced, so there is no class, so class itself is garbage collected. And that means like there are no instances. And it means that class loader is garbage collected. And when class loaders are garbage collected? Almost never. If you are using uh, your default class loaders, they, are, they have the same life cycle as your GVM. So basically, everything that is static is forever in memory. So the like, most honest answer would be when class instance is collected and when class loader is collected together. Because it should happen simultaneously, because they hold a cyclic reference to each other. So static is like sugar. It's very easy to put it. You know, we, we like it because it simplifies our lives. But the consequences could be very hard. So, Static members live almost forever. Static members, that's why static members should be avoided. And OK, if you still like, cannot avoid having static, please don't make it mutable static. So if it's an array or a list, uh, it's like uh, in the future you'll have some memory bomb. Then if you're static members, they should not be updated from non-static field. And to avoid all these problems, we actually have some rules in Sonar, which one is like one rule about mutable fields should be public static, and instance methods should not write to static fields. We would like to add more rules to avoid all the possible memory leaks, but unfortunately, static analysis is also limited, so we cannot detect all the problems, but at least we can try to prevent some big problems. Okay. We analyzed. In this case, it was easy to analyze because we know that static is a problem, so we found out the static and uh, can easily fix it. Sometimes it's much harder to find the root cause, so let's look at some different example. So here, uh, still we have similar situation. This byte array catches our attention because it holds like, a lot of memory. And then if we calculate GC roots, we can see uh, that there is some names cache, but it's not static. So there is no problem in static. But let's look deeper. Uh, this byte array is value in some string, which is a content and some full name. And this is a key in a hash map. So this time, hash map is used. I think that's not enough just to look in the um, VM, visual VM, because in this case, just looking at the visual VM, I cannot say where is the problem, because like, I don't know what was the intention of programmer. So let's look at the code. So I think it was here, example controller. So here it is. This is a map. It's not static. And if you look attentively in the code, you can see that this name could be either A or B. And when we put 
some structure, like full name, into uh, hash map, we are using this full name depending on the name. If you go here, we can see that full name is just a class that holds two fields, name, content. We have getters, we have constructor, we have equals, hash code. So feels like it's OK. Feels like if we are here putting full name of A or full name of B into hash map, there should be just two instances. There should be just full name of A or full name of B. But for some reason, we have much more of them. Right. And if you look more attentively at the full name class, come on, we can find out that equals is written correctly, but hash code is returning the random number. So basically, if you know how hash map works, means that you generate hash, you calculate the hash code, then you find out in which bucket you should put it in a hash map, and then uh, like that's how hash map works. But in our case, hash code is always random, so we cannot find like the already existing element, and we're already like always adding a new and new element. So this is the problem. The problem is that bug in a hash code. So if we get back to our slides, uh, that you can see that equals hash code are carbs. Because uh, they're great, they're, you have to use it, and they're very important to use them correctly. Because if you're using like carbs like sugar that are fast, uh, fastly go to your blood um, and transform into fat, that's not what we want. But if you're using carbs like vegetables, especially green vegetables, they give you much more energy to work. So for me, equals hash code are more like a carbs. But you have to use them wisely and choose which carbs to use. So first of all, they should be used properly. Then when you override equals, you should always override hash code. Because if you just override equals but you had no hash code, you'll have default hash code, and the situation would be similar. And there is a contract that if two objects are equal, their hash code should be the same. And this contract is there for a reason. And one more important thing, that hash map keys must be immutable. If they're not immutable, you'll face exactly the same situation as we had. Because, again, you recalculate the hash code, and you're not going to find an element in the map. So we have some rules in Sonar for this, that when you override equals, you should always override hash code. Unfortunately, for now, we don't have a rule that if you're violating the contract or no, because it's kind of hard to detect. But we have this in our mind, so maybe one day we'll have this rule to help you understand if you are violating this contract or no. So once you found the root cause, what the next step? The next obvious step is to fix it. So let's get back and find another example. Okay, Here. Here, actually, uh, this is the case when um, you look at the heap dump and you don't understand what's going on. Like, for example, I look here, the same byte array that, um, that I was doing in previous examples. I try to calculate GC roots. And actually, I don't see like, what is the problem here, because there are some more like, standard classes maybe coming from Spring Boot, because it's Spring Boot application. So maybe I need something else. So what else can we do? We can just try to find the projects, uh, the classes that are in your packages to understand whether you can, how much memory actually is held by the classes that you wrote. And if I use com example demo, which is my package, I can see that example controller three is holding uh, like two gigabytes of memory. So you can see that we are using retained memory, not the actual size of a pointer. Because retained memory means how much memory you could free if this object is garbage collected. So if this controller is garbage collected, we'll free two gigabytes of memory, which is a lot. So probably there is some problem here. So what we can do, we can investigate 
what actually is taking too much memory here? We can look at some fields. We, we see that there is field small objects, which is an array, and there are 32 elements, and they hold like 99% of the memory that is retained by example controller 3. And if you look at these small objects, you can go and see some elements. And you can see the biggest amount of memory is held by this dollar zero, which is big object. And if you look at the small object here, it's big object, dollar small object. And what does it say to us? It says to us that small object is an inner class of big object. And this holds a reference to big object. So this is non-static class inside of another class. And if we go and look in code, we can see that it, it is so. There is small object that has almost no fields. It doesn't use anything from big object, but is non-static. And in order to create it, you need to create new big object and new small object. When you just look at this code, it feels like new big object is created only here, and then we never use it, so it should be garbage collected. But because this object holds a reference to the big object, it cannot be garbage collected, and that's why you can still find this in memory. And yeah, the obvious solution would be to make it static. And make it static and then refactor it. So yeah, inner classes, they should be static. In most cases, you don't need non-static classes. If you still need them, like you should take care and understand that you'll hold the reference to outer class, and this outer class might not be very big, and the life cycle of this small object and big object should not be very long. So if you are using non-static inner classes, you should understand what is the cost and what you are doing. And in Sonar, we also have a rule that if your inner class doesn't use the properties of functions from your outer class, it should be static. So, and in most cases, uh, this is enough. And another demo that I want to show you, I think it's the last one. Um, this is another heap dump. You can see again that here we have byte array that takes almost all of the memory. And if we look here and calculate GC roots, we can find out that there is somehow a reference in thread local. So we can go and find it in code that we have indeed thread local here. We set some value, but we never remove it. Why is it the problem? Thread locals live the same like, amount of time as the thread lives. So when you create a thread, you put thread local there. Uh, once your thread disappears, your thread local also disappears. The problem is like I am not creating threads directly in my code. I am using Spring, and every request is actually executed in uh, like every, their own thread, and it's in a thread pool. So I'm using a thread pool, and that's why we are using the same threads. And it means if you left something in thread local, it will be there unless you clean it. And that's why it's important to always clean thread locals, especially if you're using thread pools. So, yeah. Another potential like problem with your memory are thread locals, because they live as long as the thread lives, they should be unset manually. And the same comes with the resources. So if you're using some resources, some put output streams, you should free resources as well. Yeah, you should free resources as well. And we have another few rules about this in Sonar. So the thread local should be cleaned up and resources should be closed. OK. V fixed our memory leaks, find all the root causes, what is the next step? The next step is to improve. What I'm talking about, let's go an extra mile. Uh, 
Previously, we were talking about memory leaks. Uh, memory leaks, we refer to the situation when we are already having some problem, when something is using like excess amount of memory and we have to get rid of this. So technically, when you're overweight and you already have some health issues. So like it's, uh, it's like hard for your health, hard for you to run, to walk, to live. To, so you need some immediate treatment. It's more about firefighting. When we are talking about memory footprint, it's a little bit different. So memory footprint refers to the amount of memory that you are using. So reducing the memory footprint is more about like when you're already in a good shape, <coughs> when you're already in a normal condition, but you want to like improve a little bit. You want more muscles, you want less fat, you want to be stronger. So this is about reducing memory footprint. Like, Fixing memory leaks, it's like more firefighting, and reducing memory footprint is more about uh, like making yourself more fit while you're already good enough. So what we can do to reduce memory footprint? First of all, let's like remove references manually. If you don't need something, just put nulls. Feels like a little bit of C++ program. Uh, another point, it could be class, custom class loaders. Uh, when we talked about statics, we discover that they live forever. What we can do with this? Uh, we can write some custom class loader. So if we write it, we can control the life cycle of this class loader. And that's why we can be sure that some static fields of these classes are garbage collected. Another thing that we can do is to minimize the living scope of your objects. So if you don't need it, like remove it, so put it as close to, to the usage as possible. Like instead of some global variables, instead of some fields, prefer local variables, because they cleaned faster. And yeah, do all the necessary cleanup. If your object holds some state and you don't need the state any, anymore, clean this up. And another possible technique that you can do is to use weak references. For example, there could be situations when you don't care and the creation of the object is, uh, not, uh, is not that expensive, but holding it in the memory is very expensive. Uh, so it's easier for you to tell garbage collectors that you can, you can collect this reference if you don't need it, and then if you need it again, you'll recreate it. But there is one thing that you should remember. While you're reducing memory footprint, we should find some balance because balance is the key. Sometimes when you're losing too much weight or you're using too much muscles. And uh, for example, when I lost too much, it was harder for me to uh, lift some heavy weight. And the same for your application. If you are always cleaning up, if you have some a lot of custom class loaders and you recreating and using weak references, it affects your performance. Because if you need this object again, you have to manually recreate it. If you need to load this class again, it takes time, so it comes with some performance cost. So you need to find the balance to understand what is the right, cho right choice for your application. Because there is no silver bullet here. So we improved our application. We already fixed our memory leaks, we improved it. What the last and the most important step to do is to prevent. Let's make some, take some measures that will, uh, to make sure that memory leak won't appear again, or at least won't appear again in exactly the same place. So what we can do? Remember how it all started. It all started from Alexei Shapilov saying that I cannot uh, analyze it with three gigabytes of RAM. So what was actually the problem? If we look about, um, in the way how we execute the analysis, we have a list of plugins, like C++ plugin, Java plugin, Kotlin plugin, Scala plugin, and they're like in a list. And in this list, we are iterating over them with for each and execute it. And the problem was like, Java was executed first. It ate almost all the memory, because there was a memory leak here. Then C++ had to execute their analysis and cannot. So 
one thing that could help us to prevent this memory leak from affecting our users could be like reduce the life of plugin. And for example, let's use the queue instead of list. So if there was a queue instead of list, we would just poll. And uh, once like Java plugin is executed, um, it's garbage collected. And then we can use uh, like C++ plugin without all this garbage that Java left in the memory. Um, but on the one hand, it could mask the problem. On the other hand, our users would have much, much better user experience. And what we can else do is to do some cleanup between the plugins. For example, remove some references that are still referenced in Java. And uh, this way, we'll reduce some memory. So this would probably look like this if we would use array instead of a list. And here are a few small tips what we can do to prevent potential leaks. Firstly, follow healthy diet. I'll tell you in the summer of this talk what is a healthy diet for your application. Then like monitor memory usage. Like from time to time, look at how much memory you're using before there is any problem. Try to like find like look at this beforehand before you have any problem. A look at GC logs. Uh, perform some stress testing, or for example, in our case, we can try to execute analysis on some unusual inputs on some bigger projects, projects like OpenGDK, like other compilers, and maybe we'll find out much more places where we have problems. And use tools like Visual VM, like Eclipse Memory Analyzer, maybe Flight Recorder. And another thing that we can do is to add tests. Uh, is like somewhere in the beginning, I told you that there is a tool called Java Object Layout that can show you how much uh, memory, uh, what is actually a layout of some objects in your memory or uh, layout of classes and even VMs. So with this tool, you can actually write some sort of a test. For example, you remember that this big object caused some big trouble previously. So add an assertion, say that this object should not hold that much memory, and for example, put a max size there. So if you eventually, if you're developing and one day you exceed this max size, this test will fail, and you'll have to investigate. Is it failed because you just naturally, or maybe you introduced another leak? Of course, it won't save like you every time, but at least some cases can detect. So this is the healthy diet. Just to say it again, avoid static and mutability, clean thread locals, free resources, avoid non-static inner classes. If still need something of this list, be careful, reduce the scope of references, and do monitoring. And uh, yeah, I was telling you about this story with Alexei, so let's sum up how the story ended. By the way, maybe last question, Please raise your hands if you think that the story ended successfully. And not successfully. <laughs> and what other things? <laughs> OK, the story ended happily. So we had a happy ending. Uh, Alexei um, posted a tweet that some time ago he moved Sonar Cloud to some smaller machines, and he got out of memory with 3 gigabytes of heap. Then we fixed this memory leaks, and now it's less than 1.2 gigabytes of RAM. So Alexei is very happy. We are very happy because we don't have any memory leak. And because of valuable contributions that Alexei did by reporting this memory leaks, we sent him a t-shirt that he is our community hero. And this is very important. If you ever face any problems with Sonar and you're using our community forum, if you're doing valuable contributions, we recognize it and we send t-shirts. So don't forget to be active community members because you're not only going to improve your life, you're going to improve life like of your colleagues all over the world, and you might get this nice t-shirt. So here are some useful links that you can use that I used while preparing this presentation. Thank you for coming, for your attention, for being here. And questions?
any questions? Everything was clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we can take some group picture while you're still here. So I can show to my colleagues that a few people came to, to listen about memory. Like, say cheers. Okay, take yourself and my Twitter 